Welcome. This is the one year Bible reading for July 19th, and we are going to be finishing the book of First Chronicles today in our Old Testament reading, starting in chapter 28, verse 1. And we're going to hear today about uh, David's reign and life. David summoned all his officials to Jerusalem, the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of the 12 army divisions, the other generals and captains, the overseers of the royal property and livestock, the palace officials, the mighty men, and all the other warriors in the kingdom. David rose and stood before them and addressed them as follows. My brothers and my people, it was my desire to build a temple where the ark of the Lord's covenant, God's footstool, would rest permanently. I made the necessary preparations for building it. But God said to me, you must not build a temple to honor my name for you are a warrior and have shed much blood. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, has chosen among my father's family to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen the tribe of Judah to rule. From among the families of Judah, he chose my father's family. And from among my father's sons, the Lord was pleased to make me king over all Israel. And from among my sons, for the Lord has given me many children, he chose Solomon to succeed me on the throne of his kingdom of Israel. He said to me, your son Solomon will build my temple and its courtyards, for I have chosen him as my son, and I will be his father. And if he continues to obey my commands and regulations as he does now, I will make his kingdom last forever. So now, with God as our witness, I give you this charge for all Israel, the Lord's assembly. Be careful to obey all the commands of the Lord your God, so that you may possess this good land and leave it to your children as a permanent inheritance. And Solomon, my son, get to know the God of your ancestors, worship and serve him with your whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord sees every heart and understands and knows every plan and thought. If you seek him, you will find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. So take this seriously. The Lord has chosen you to build a temple as his sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. Now, we are his holy temple today, scripture says, right? The New Testament. Um, so we are sort of given the same kind of assignment and told, be strong and do the work. Then David gave Solomon the plans for the temple and its surroundings, including the treasuries, the upstairs rooms, the inner rooms, and the inner sanctuary where the ark's cover, the place of atonement would be kept. David also gave Solomon all the plans he had in mind for the courtyards of the Lord's temple, the outside rooms, the treasuries of God's temple, and the rooms for the dedicated gifts. The king also gave Solomon the instructions concerning the work of the various divisions of priests and Levites in the temple of the Lord. And he gave specifications for the items in the Lord's temple which were to be used for worship and sacrifice. David gave instructions regarding how much gold and silver should be used to make the necessary items. He told Solomon the amount of gold needed for the gold lampstands and lamps, and the amount of silver for the silver lampstands and lamps, depending on how each would be used. He designated the amount of gold for the table, on which the bread of the presence would be placed, and the amount of silver for the other tables. David also designated the amount of gold for the solid gold meat hooks used to handle the sacrificial meat, and for the basins, pitchers, and dishes, as well as the amount of silver for every dish. Finally, he designated the amount of refined gold for the altar of incense and for the gold cherubim, whose wings were stretched out over the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. Every part of this plan, David told Solomon, was given to me in writing from the hand of the Lord. So even though David didn't, didn't build the temple, the Lord involved him in that building and he then prepared his son to do the work. I just, I continue to just really like that concept. Then David continued, be strong and courageous and do the work. Don't be afraid or discouraged by the size of the task for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. He will see to it that all the work related to the temple of the Lord is finished correctly. The various divisions of priests and Levites will serve in the temple of God. Others with skills of every kind will volunteer, and the leaders in the entire nation are at your command. 
Then King David turned to the entire, entire assembly and said, my son Solomon, whom God has chosen to be the next king of Israel, is still young and inexperienced. The work ahead of him is enormous, for the temple will, he will build is not just another building, it is for the Lord God himself. Using every resource at my command, I have gathered as much as I could for building the temple of my God. Now there is enough gold, silver, bronze, iron, and wood, as well as great quantities of onyx, other precious stones, costly jewels, and all kinds of fine stone and marble. And now, because of my devotion to the temple of my God, I am giving all of my own private treasures of gold and silver to help in the construction. This is in addition to the building materials I have already collected for his holy temple. I am donating more than 112 tons of gold, can you imagine, from Ophir, and over 262 tons of refined silver to be used for overlaying the walls of the buildings and for the other gold and silver work to be done by the craftsmen. Now then, who will follow my example? Who is willing to give offerings to the Lord today? Then the family leaders, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, the general, the captains of the army, and the king's administrative officers all gave willingly. For the construction of the temple of God, they gave almost 188 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins, and 375 tons of silver about 675 tons of bronze and about 3,750 tons of iron. They also contributed numerous precious stones which were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord under the care of Jehiel, a descendant of Gershon. The people rejoiced over the offerings for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord and King David was filled with joy. Then David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. O oh Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O oh Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Riches and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand. And it is at your discretion that people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you. And we give you only what you have already given us. We are here for only a moment, visitors and strangers in the land as our ancestors were before us. Our days on earth are like a shadow, gone so soon without a trace. O oh Lord our God, even these materials that we have gathered to build a temple to honor your holy name come from you. It all belongs to you. I know, my God, that you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity there. You know I have done all this with good motives, and I have watched your people offer their gifts willingly and joyously. O oh Lord, the God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, make your people always want to obey you. See to it that their love for you never changes. Give my son Solomon the wholehearted desire to obey all your commands, decrees, and principles, and to build this temple for which I have made all these preparations. Then David said to the whole assembly, give praise to the Lord your God. And the entire assembly praised the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and they bowed low and knelt before the Lord and the king. The next day they brought a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, and a thousand male lambs as burnt offerings to the Lord. They also brought drink offerings and many other sac sacrifices on behalf of Israel. They feasted and drank in the Lord's presence with great joy that day. And again they crowned David's son, Solomon, as their new king. They anointed him before the Lord as their leader, and they anointed Zadok as their priest. So Solomon took the throne of the Lord in the place of his father David, and he prospered greatly, and all Israel obeyed him. All the royal officials, the army commanders, and the sons of King David pledged their loyalty to King Solomon. And the Lord exalted Solomon, so the entire nation of Israel stood in awe of him, and he gave Solomon even greater wealth and honor than his father. So David, son of Jesse, reigned over all Israel, he ruled Israel for 40 years in all, seven years from Hebron 
and 33 years from Jerusalem. He died at a ripe old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. Then his son Solomon ruled in his place. All the events of King David's reign from beginning to end are written in the record of Samuel the seer, the record of Nathan the prophet, and the record of Gad the seer. These accounts include the mighty deeds of his reign and everything that happened to him and to Israel and to all the surrounding kingdoms. Romans 5, 6-21 When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now no one is likely to die for a good person, though someone might be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's judgment. For since we were uh, restored to friendship with God by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in making us friends of God. When Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. And though there was no law to break, since it had not yet been given, they all died anyway even though they did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. What a contrast between Adam and Christ who was yet to come. And what a difference between our sin and God's generous gift of forgiveness. For this one man, Adam, brought death to many through his sin. But this other man, Jesus Christ, brought forgiveness to many through God's bountiful gift. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But we have the free gift of being accepted by God, even though we are guilty of many sins. The sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over us, but all who receive God's wonderful, gracious gift of righteousness will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brought condemnation upon everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness makes all people right in God's sight and gives them life. Because one person disobeyed God, many people became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many people will be made right in God's sight. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful kindness became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful kindness rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Psalm 15. Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts those who refuse to slander others or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends, those who despise persistent sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord and keep their promises even when it hurts, those who do not charge interest on the money they lend or and who refuse to accept bribes to testify against the innocent, such people will stand firm forever. Proverbs 19, 18 and 19 Discipline your children while there is still hope. If you don't, you will ruin their lives. Short-tempered people must pay their own penalty. If you rescue them once, you will have to do it again. To end today, I wanted to share with you a passage that I really like from The Life You've Always Wanted by John Ortberg. And the tagline is Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary People. And I love John Ortberg's writing, and um, this is just a really practical book I want to recommend to you. It's great. Um, And this section is talking about spiritual disciplines in a chapter called Training Versus Trying. Um, Trying our own effort. Training is learning to stay the the course with God. So um, this, this is Signs of Wise Spiritual Training. Wise training respects the freedom of the spirit. 
And Jesus says, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And John Ortberg writes, consider the difference between piloting a motorboat and a sailboat. We can run a motorboat all by ourselves. We can fill the tank and start the engine. We are in constant control, but a sailboat is, in diff is a different story. We can hoist the sails and steer the rudder, but we are utterly dependent on the wind. The wind does the work. If the wind doesn't blow, and it sometimes it doesn't, we sit still in the water no matter how frantic we act. Our task is to do whatever enables us to catch the wind. Spiritual transformation is that way. We may be aggressively pursuing it, but we cannot turn it on and off. We can open ourselves to transformation through certain practices, but we cannot engineer it. We can take no credit for it. It is profitable to see this. This truth saves us from pride and misdirected effort. Fist-clenching, teeth-gritting exertion is usually not productive. Instead, feeling a constant sense of strain or burden probably indicates that we are off course. Jesus offered his yoke, his way of life, to tired people because he said that his way of life involved ease and lightness and rest for your souls. This theme is echoed by many of his followers. Frank Laubach writes, The sense of being led by an unseen hand that takes mine grows upon me daily. I do not need to strain at all to find opportunity. Strain does not seem to do good. Another analogy from sailboating concerns the fact that wise sailors know that their main task is being able to, quote, read the wind, to practice discernment. An experienced sailor can simply look at a lake and tell where the wind is blowing strong, strongest or look at the sky and give a weather forecast. A wise sailor knows when to raise and lower which sails to catch the wind most efficiently and effectively. Spiritual growth requires discernment. We must learn to respond to the fresh wind of the spirit. Moses didn't ask or arrange for the burning bush, but once it was there, he had to make a choice whether to turn aside or to pay attention to the work of God. God's responsibility is to provide the burning bush. Our responsibility is to turn aside. Often, I forget this. I'll just read a little bit more. I love this whole chapter, but some time ago, I bought a devotional book and set a goal of finishing it by the end of the year. Several times I read it, as I read it, I was, it was clear that something was happening in my heart. I felt I should stop and study a certain passage for a while but such delays would have kept me from my goal of finishing the book, so I kept going. I should have realized that getting through the book, quote, on time, was not, as I thought, a, the way to demonstrate my devotion. The purpose was to put myself in a place where trans transformation could happen. If God should speak to me through one passage, if I am being convicted or healed or challenged, then my role is to stay there until the wind dies down. Then it's time to move on. I was motorboating instead of sailing. I failed to turn aside. Our primary task is not to calculate how many verses of scripture we read or how many minutes we spend in prayer. Our task is to use these activities to create opportunities for God to work. Then what happens is up to him. We just put up sails. The wind blows where it chooses. So thank you for putting up your sails with me this morning and listening to the scriptures. I hope you have a wonderful day. Love you all.